So today we have a special guest speaker. He's come here before, uh, Dr. Robert Haddad. He is a teacher, theologian, and apologist. And he's also an author of many books, in which will be available to sell after this talk at the back over there, if you're interested. And today, considering this is the season of Lent, we decided to bring him in, bring him in, bring him in, sorry, to do a talk on Jesus transforming the Last Supper and the Passover. So without further ado, a round of applause for our guest speaker. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I love coming here, and uh, I've been here quite a few times, some smaller groups and big groups like this. It's a, it's a great honor, and I'm excited. This is a very, very interesting topic, but it's a challenging one. And I'm going to give it to you in a way I haven't given it before to anyone else. In other words, I'm going to give you the, the most complex extended version. Because I'm, at the moment, I'm doing a Bible study on the Passion of Christ in the Gospel of John for another parish. So I've learned new things about how Jesus changed the Passover. And I'm going to pass them on to you. And there's also a section which is very difficult, and I'm afraid I might lose you during that section. On, and, and that section deals with apparent contradictions between the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John as to when the Passover was when Jesus died that year, okay? I'll try and keep it simple, but I want to do it, and uh, we'll see how it goes. At the end, I'm open to any questions. I don't know how long this is going to take. It's 20 to 8 at the moment. You'll be all finished and gone by 9 o'clock. Don't worry, okay? I won't have you here for you know, too much of an agony. And if you need to go, you need to go. Don't, don't worry about that. All right, the Passover. We in the church always celebrate Easter connected with the Passover because the original Easter was connected with the celebration of the Jewish Passover. However, we need to understand what the Passover was for the Jews. What did it celebrate? How was it structured? We need to know that first before we look at how Jesus changed the Passover when he celebrated it with his disciples just before he was arrested, put on trial, crucified, etc. We have to understand the new Passover, the new Passover of the Messiah and what Jesus achieved through his new Passover for us. That's why we're doing this. It's not just a study of scripture and a little bit of history and a bit of theology. It's understanding exactly what Jesus Christ did for us, did for the world through the Passover of the Messiah. That's the most important thing. All right, let's look at the Jewish Passover as they celebrated it. The Feast of Passover, otherwise known as Pesach for the Jews, was the annual great Jewish memorial event. It was one of three feasts that every Jewish man in Judea and within a certain radius of Jerusalem, it was compulsory for them to attend. Passover, Tabernacles and Pentecost were the three compulsory feasts for all men. For women, it was optional and women often came, all right, though it wasn't compulsory for women. Now, the Passover is an eight-day festival, starting on the 14th day of the month of Nisan for the Jews. Now, how did that, how exactly did they measure the 14th? It was actually on the night of the 14th. So once the sun set, the next day began. And they had the Passover meal in the evening of the 14th of Nisan, which was technically now the 15th of Nisan. Now the month, now this is the, this is the, the Passover was also known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was an eight-day festival. So it began on the night, the first day was the night of the 14th of Nisan. And it continued to the 22nd of Nisan. Now, I think in Arabic, what's, how do we pronounce the month for April in Arabic? Yeah, you got it. Say it louder. Nisan. That's no coincidence. Because 
In the Jewish calendar, it was the first month of the year, and it corresponds with our March, April. So we've inherited, as Arab Christians, a relic of how the Jews named their months. And by the way, in the ancient world, in the time when Jesus was in the world, the first month was not January. It was March. All right? And the last month was February, which is why it's the shortest. And when they added leap years, both in the Julian calendar and in the Gregorian calendar, they added it to the end of the year, which was February. Okay? And if you don't believe me, if you know a little bit of Latin, let's have a look at the name of some of the months. September. Sep for seven. October. Oct. Octagon. Eight in Latin. November. Nov. Nine. December. Decimal. Decade. The tenth month. So we see how we're a little bit out of order compared to the ancients. And in many respects, the ancients had it more right than us. We say at the moment, ah, we're in, uh, we are in autumn now since the 1st of March. No, autumn doesn't begin until the 22nd of March, astronomically, okay? I won't divert too much. Now, the Passover meal itself was called the Seder, and that means order, because it had a certain liturgical order about it. And it was celebrated, as I said, on the first day of this eight-day feast of unleavened bread. So it was celebrated, it meant to be celebrated, on the night of the 14th of Nisan, which was technically, as I said earlier, the 15th of Nisan. What was being remembered? This was a memorial meal. It was a celebration. They remembered the past, the original Passover, the Passover of the angel of death over Egypt that killed the firstborn of all of Egypt, humans and animals. And that plague was the one that finally forced Pharaoh to relent. Probably that was Ramses II, could have been Thermotos III, we don't know because the scripture doesn't name the Pharaoh, and forced that Pharaoh to relent to release the Israelites from the captivity, from the slavery of Egypt. This is the Exodus event, leaving Egypt. The deliverance, and the deliverance for the Hebrews, or they Israelites, to be more exact, Israelites, they are the 12 tribes, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Uh, the Hebrews were more than the Israelites. The Hebrews were all the descendants of Abraham from the children of all his three wives. So Ishmael was also a Hebrew from Hagar, and his third wife, Keturah, had six sons through Keturah, they were all born after Isaac. All of the descendants of those three wives and those children are Hebrews. But only the 12 sons of Jacob are Israelites. And only one of those 12 tribes are Jews from Judah. Okay, just for your own technical understanding here. Now, the Israelites were delivered. They were spared from the angel of death because they had the blood of the lamb placed over the lentils of their doors and their windows. And when the angel of death saw the lamb's blood, the angel passed over the homes of the Israelites. And none of the firstborn of the Israelites were put to death. This was a memorial celebration that the Israelites, and later on the Jews as a remnant of the Israelites, were meant to celebrate every year. Now, there are periods of healthy observance and there are periods of great decadence with the people of God, like the church today, unfortunately. But this memorial wasn't simply reflecting on an event in the past. Normally, when we have a memorial, we, we remember something or someone that happened or existed in the past. But this memorial has a special Greek word, anamnesis, anamnesis which is a memorial that attempts to reenact that original event and make that past event present. You need to understand that. So and that will help you understand what Christians do today in the divine liturgy, in the mass, 
The Mass is also an anamnesis. It's a memorial that makes present a past event. So, where did, this, where did the Passover meal take place? Where was it meant to be celebrated and to be eaten? It was meant to be eaten in the family home. And the father was the one who presided over the Passover liturgy. So the father, the mother, and the children were all present. And, it's, and it started with questions from a child. Father, why is this night different than any other night? Because they're remembering the night of the Passover of the angel of death. So that's the first question that starts the Passover liturgy. Then there's a re recounting of the covenants made by Yahweh, or God. Yahweh is the name of God only really from the time of Moses onwards. I am who I am. Right? The acronym is Yahweh is formed from the first Hebrew letter, yod Hey vav Hey. They're the Hebrew letters. Yod, hey, vav, hey are consonants. There's no vowels, but we pronounce it probably Yahweh. So that's the name of God from the time of Moses. But in the Passover liturgy, they remember the covenant that God made with Abraham. And the chief one of them is that you'll be the father of many peoples that will number as the stars. And from you will come one who will be a blessing to all the nations. And the covenant with Moses as well. So that's the one that the Israelites and the remnant Jews would have been living under, most specifically the covenant with Moses. They're the ones that are remembered. And then the Exodus event is recounted by the father. Moses, conflict with Pharaoh, the ten plagues, the Passover itself, the escape from Egypt, the passing through the waters of the Reed Sea, the, con the destruction of the Egyptian army and then passing into the Sinai. We can do a talk just about that, what that means for Christians as well, but that's for another occasion. And this is all done before those in the celebrating or participating in the Seder meal have consumed the second cup. Now, the, the Passover meal had four cups and they are named as follows. The Kedush cup, Kedush, the sanctifying cup, the sanctification cup. In Arabic, Kedush means holy, doesn't it? The holy cup, the sanctifying cup. Then you have the second cup called the Haggadah, the Haggadah, the proclamation of Scripture. So there's, they drink the first cup, the Kedush, the second cup, the Haggadah. The third cup, is the better cup, blessing, cup of blessing. Again, remember that. I'm asking you to do a lot. Remember, better cup, cup of blessing, the third cup. And then the fourth cup is the Hallel cup, the cup of praise. You need to bank that four cups to understand what Jesus does and what he does differently. Then there food, there's food eaten between the second and the third cups. What was the food? Bitter herbs, remember. They had to remember how life was unpleasant in Egypt. And they remembered those 400 years of slavery by consuming bitter herbs. Horseradish and horoset. I don't think I've ever had any of them, but they, just imagine that they are rather bitter. Okay. And then they ate the unleavened bread. So remember, between the second and the third cup, they're eating horseradish, haraset, and the unleavened bread called the matzot, the matzot, the flat bread. Now, us from the Middle East, we're used to flat bread. Right? This sliced bread thing is only modern. All right? Flat bread. 50 years ago, if I was seen eating that type of bread in schools, they came around me, tormented me, and called me names. Now, these same people who called me names or going to Lebanese restaurants and eating the same thing today, okay? All right. Flat bread, the mat salt, okay? The unleavened bread, it's unleavened because it has to be unleavened 
because they don't have enough time, the Israelites, to bake it properly with yeast to have it rise. The, it, the unleavened bread was for, for them to remember how they had to suddenly, quickly escape from Egypt. They didn't even have, didn't even have time to bake bread properly. Okay? And then they ate the roasted lamb. Now the lamb, lamb, the lamb of God. This was a special lamb. Couldn't be any lamb. Had to be male, one years of age, unblemished, perfect. No defects, no broken bones. You can't sacrifice to God something that's imperfect. That makes you a poor priest. You sacrifice something that's worthy of God, something valuable to you. So it had to be unblemished, male, one years of age. What happened? Where did they get the lamb from? On the day of the 14th of Nisan, before nightfall, in the temple itself, they are sacrificing the lambs, about 250,000 of them. When you read Jewish histories here, there's blood, rivers of blood flowing out of the temple. Imagine slaughtering a quarter of a million sheep on the one day. What they did, they slit the throat, they drained it of all the blood, then they pierced the lamb with two sticks, north, south, east, west. What is, what's that shape? North, south, east, west. What is it, what's that shape? Say it. Cross. The lamb is crucified. And the father takes the lamb that's shed all its blood, and there's no blood left in it, that's, in the, that's been T-shaped into a cruciform form, and he takes it home. And then they roast it. It's a barbecue, and they eat the lamb between the second and the third cups. Now, of course, the lamb was to remember the blood of the lamb that saved them from the angel of death. They took the blood, remember, they put it, they painted it above the lintels of the doors and the windows, and they were spared. <clears throat> Now, this was all done in the afternoon. The lambs were slaughtered in the afternoon after midday on the 14th of Nisan. Again, remember that, okay, when I come to the hardest part of this presentation. It was essential for the proper celebration of the Passover meal for all the cups to be drunk, for the bitter herbs to be eaten, for the matzot bread to be eaten, and for the lamb the sacrificed lamb to be eaten. So the Passover meal was both a meal and a sacrifice. The sacrificial aspect was the lamb itself that was slit, drained of blood and consumed. After that, they sang the Hallel Psalm, Psalms 115 to 118. And then... This was between the third and the fourth cup. So, so I should say that they had the third cup, the cup of the Bedekah cup, the cup of blessing they drank after they ate all these herbs and bread and lamb. And between the third and the fourth cups, they sang the Hallel Psalms. And then they had the last cup, the fourth cup, which was the Hallel cup. And when they drank the fourth cup, the father who presided over the Passover meal said, it is finished. The consummation cup. The Hallel cup is also called the consummation cup or the it is finished cup. Okay, so now that you get an idea of what was the original Passover. And some of you I can tell by looking at your faces are thinking, I get this. I see a lot of Christian imagery already embedded in a Jewish or Israelite liturgical practice, okay? Because we are, we're wearing Jesus glasses. And because we're wearing Jesus glasses, we can reflect on this event and see the Christian aspects to it. All right. Now we're going to look at the Last Supper with Jesus and the disciples in the upper room. Who's been to the Holy Land here? Right, not not many. One hands up, really high. One, what two? You've been to Jerusalem, 
Did you go to the, keep your hands up if you went to the, up the, the place where they believe the Last Supper was celebrated. Okay, that place doesn't exist anymore. There's a new building on that site from the Middle Ages. But that is probably the site where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. And it's in the southwest of the old city of Jerusalem. That's important. The Passover meal of Jesus was a different Passover. For many reasons, it was the Passover of the Messiah, a new Passover celebrated by a new Moses to effect a new exodus for the new people of God. How was Jesus' Passover meal with the disciples different to the standard Passover meal? Firstly, it was not celebrated with a family. It was celebrated with his 12 disciples, including Judas Iscariot. Secondly, there was a focus on a different covenant, not the covenant with Abraham and Moses. That, that, that could have been focused on initially. We don't know. We don't have enough data in the Gospels. that give, the, the Gospels don't give us every particular detail, but there's a focus on the new covenant. Just fast forwarding a little bit, when Jesus comes to the third cup, he says this is, the, this is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. There's a focus on the new covenant. And that's reflective of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 27. He said, the prophet there, this is about 600 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah said, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And also, when you read, I've got a mistake here, a different, wrong reference. I've got Exodus 16. No, when you read Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel, that prophet, who's also a contemporary of Jeremiah, but in Babylon, not in Judah, Ezekiel speaks of a similar new covenant that God will make in the future. And God makes that new covenant through Jesus at this last supper. Okay? So there's a focus on a new covenant in the Passover of the Messiah. There's no mention in the Gospels of the body and blood of the Passover lamb. There's only a mention of Christ's body and blood. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. We also, now this is where it's getting a little bit hard now, entering the danger zone here now, all right? We look at John's gospel. We have to look at the synoptics. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and see what they all say about the Last Supper because they say different things, and we have to piece the two together to get a complete picture. We don't get, we don't get a complete picture of the Last Supper, celebrated by Jesus with his disciples, unless we also look at John's Gospel, chapters 13 to 17, otherwise known by scholars as the Book of Glory. All right? So when we look at John 13 to 17, we see that there are other things Jesus said and did between the second and the third cups that the synoptic Gospel writers don't mention. Jesus has the washing of the feet ceremony in chapter 13, right, where he's teaching his disciples what real leadership is. You've come to serve rather than be served. It was also a test of obedience for St. Peter, okay? Washing of the feet ceremony. Secondly, the prediction by Jesus of his betrayal and how he dips the bread into the horror set and he gives it to Judas. And Judas walks out into the night, which is symbolic of Judas. The devil has now entered into him. And Lucifer, sorry, Judas has submitted to the temptation completely to betray Jesus. This was a betrayal that was one year in the making. Judas had already begun to lose faith in Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, a year earlier when he couldn't accept what Jesus said in the Bread of Life discourse there in northern Israel, northern Holy Land, above the Sea of Galilee at Capernaum, 
when Jesus spoke about, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him and I'll raise him up on the last day. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. When Jesus is speaking like that, the vast majority of his followers, and this is recorded in John 6, walked away from Jesus thinking, who could hear this? This is intolerable. This is madness. If I'm standing in front of you saying that if you want to get to heaven, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're out of here. And those who bought my books want their money back. Okay? All right? You can't hear this. This is nonsense talk. So looking at John 6.66, it appears to be the case that Judas also lost faith. And finally, it breaks for him at the Last Supper. He takes the morsel from Jesus' hand, our Lord's last goodwill gesture to him, and he goes into the darkness of the night. So this is Judas has gone to betray him. That's in chapter 16. Now, John doesn't tell us anything about the institution of the Eucharist during the Passover meal. He doesn't because it's already known to his Christian audience from the other three Gospels and from St. Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But probably it's but after Judas has left, Jesus takes the bread and says, take, eat, this is my body. Takes the third cup, the cup of blessing, and says, take, drink. This is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this in memory of me. So because Judas has probably left before Jesus celebrates the first Eucharist, Judas did not receive the Eucharist and he was never made a priest. But there are very strong opinions in the church by men, great men, doctors, saints, fathers of the church who argue that, yes, Judas did receive the Eucharist and was made a priest before he left. I'm giving you an opinion here from what I, my own personal reading of the Gospels, and it looks to me from John's Gospel that Judas left before Jesus instituted the Eucharist and the priesthood. And then, then we... So Judas has left, Jesus celebrates the first Eucharist, and then Jesus... Pro pronounces his priestly prayer in chapter 17. He's now, it's called priestly prayer because Judas has gone into the dark to begin the passion of Christ. This is the hour of glory for Christ. Christ's glory will be affected by him fulfilling the will of the Father. He glorifies the Father by doing the will of the Father to submit to the plan of salvation. And he is glorified for his obedience. And in this prayer... Jesus also prays for the disciples and those who would come to the truth through the disciples then and in the future and for the unity of Christians. We don't have unity for Christians today, not because Jesus' prayer failed, because we in our freedom, we've abused our freedom and we've defied that prayer of unity, that they may all be one. Now this was, this is, this is, the new Passover, as I said, all deliberately altered by Jesus, and there's more to come. Was a lamb eaten in the Last Supper? We're not sure. Ordinarily in the Passover meal, the sacrificed lamb would have been eaten between the second and the third cups. But when we go to John's Gospel, now we're getting to the very difficult part of tonight's talk. John tells us that when Jesus was being crucified, they were sacrificing the lambs in the temple for the Passover meal that night. We know from chapter 18 that when Jesus is already appearing before Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate and Herod and Pilate again, that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees had yet to have their Passover meal. Now, if Jesus already had his Passover meal the night before, where did he get his lamb from? Because they hadn't sacrificed them yet in the temple. This is all speculation. We don't know for certain. My personal view is that Jesus changed the Passover to such an extent that the lamb that was eaten by the disciples was not a lamb that was sacrificed in the temple as it should have been because that was still to come. 
the day, the next day. But the lamb that Jesus gave that was sacrificed was his own sacred body and precious blood, the Eucharist, when he gave it to them between the second and the third cups. Okay. Now, when, you, when we look at the Gospels, the, the, what, what do they agree on? The synoptics and John agree that Jesus had his last supper with the disciples on a Thursday night. They all agree that Jesus was crucified between 12 midday and 3 p.m. on the Friday. What they don't agree on is what day was the Passover. According to the synoptics, the Passover was on the Friday of that year. But John says it was on the Saturday of that year. They're both right. What do you mean they're both right? It's a contradiction. Yeah, because there are two different calendars operating. Now, astronomically, we know that in the reign of Pontius Pilate, this procurator of Judea, from AD 26 to AD 36, never was the Passover ever officially on a Friday. It was on a Saturday, twice in the year AD 30 and the year AD 33. So Jesus was crucified either Friday the 7th, AD 30, or Friday the 3rd, AD 33. One of those two dates. So astronomically, the official Passover was on the Saturday in the year Jesus was crucified. According to John, so I could say John's gospel is correct. Does that mean that the, the synoptics are wrong and that they're in error and that they're, they're all in contradiction? No, because the synoptics are recording the calendar that Jesus was following. Jesus was following the rebel calendar, not the official calendar. Jesus wasn't following the calendar of the Sadducees, the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes which is the calendar celebration that, that John records. Jesus celebrated his last supper in the southwest of the old city, in the Essene quarter. The Essenes were those religious, like monks, male, celibate, who lived like monks out there in Qumran, and John the Baptist for some time associated with them. Their calendar, their Passover was on the Friday of that year. And the Gospels, since the synoptics are recording how Jesus celebrated that Passover calendar in that year. So they're both right, because the synoptics are recording the Essene dating, or the Essene calendar, and John, the official calendar. How do we know that Jesus was in the Essene quarter? It's a very oblique, very oblique uh, clue. And it's from the fact that in Luke 22.10, Jesus tells the disciples to find that room in which they're going to celebrate their Passover. And there's a man recorded carrying a jar of water. That's the clue that they celebrated their Passover in the Essene quarter of the city. How do you get that? Because culturally in Judea at that time, Men never carry jars of water. Dare I say, in that culture, at that time, that was considered the work of women. So why here is a man carrying a jar of water? Because he was a celibate. He belonged to the Essene community. They, didn't have, they weren't married. They didn't have women to do this for them. They had to do it themselves. That's the clue. All right. Now... I made that a little bit simpler, and I'm glad I did. Uh, otherwise, I would have lost you to some extent. Now, what does Jesus do? Let's come back. I think I've passed through the most difficult part of the talk now. So, Jesus has drunk the first cup, drunk the second cup, eaten the bitter, her eaten the bitter herbs, eaten the, um, the matzot bread. Before that, he washed their feet. 
He, Judas betrays, goes to betray him. What does Jesus do with the matzot bread? This is when he changes it. Take, eat, this is my body. And in doing that, he fulfills the promise he made a year earlier at, back up there in the north at Capernaum. When you go to John 6, 27, 28, Jesus speaks about the bread that God gave through Moses that sustained the Israelites in Sinai in the desert. Jesus said, but everyone who ate that bread died. I will give you another bread, and he who eats this bread shall live forever. Jesus fulfills that now with the matzot bread. Take, eat, this is my body. With the cup, this is now the third cup. The cup, the barakah cup. The cup of blessing. Take and drink. This is my blood. The blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this in memory of me. Why shed just for many? It's shed for all. But only many will benefit. Meaning there will be people who won't accept, won't believe, won't be saved as a consequence. So here, Jesus in the, with the third cup fulfills the other part of the bread of life discourse. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know how significant the Eucharist is just from those words? When we receive the Eucharist like you did tonight, you receive Christ's sacred body and precious blood with his soul and divinity. But what body did you receive? What blood did you receive? Of course, it's Christ's body and blood, but glorified. The Christ, the body you receive is not the dead body of Christ, but the glorified, resurrected body that's now in heaven. I'll come back to that. There's a scripture I have to read to you about that. You receive Christ's resurrected, glorified body and blood. This is what St. Ignatius of Antioch, the great third bishop of Antioch, said who was ordained a bishop by St. Peter, succeeded Evodius, who succeeded St. Peter as the bishop of Antioch, wrote to the Ephesians in AD 110 that this is, and also he wrote to the Romans and the Smyrnaeans, all in the same journey, about the Eucharist. And he called the Eucharist the antidote to death, the fruit of resurrection, and the antidote to death, the antidote for death. In other words, it's the food that's going to enable us to rise again on the last day in a glorified body, a body ready for heaven. You can't be in heaven as you are in your body. God is a consuming fire. If you can't be in the presence of a raging fire, how can you be now with your body in the presence of the almighty, eternal, infinite God who is, according to the book of Hebrews, a consuming fire? You need a special space suit to be in heaven. And like you need a space suit to be in space and you need a space suit suit to walk on the moon and they're going to need space suits to walk on Mars. To be in heaven, you need a space suit. You need a heaven suit. And your heaven suit is your glorified body, which you receive as a consequence of receiving Christ's glorified body in the Eucharist. Now, you, after hearing this, you should never come to Mass again with a mediocre attitude about the Eucharist. And some of you should be thinking, Hey, this food is available every day. Well, for the as Jesus said in the Bread of Life discourse, the Israelites ate this bread. It was given to them six days a week. Every morning they found the, they found the manhu. That's in Hebrew, manhu. We say manna in English. Six days a week on the ground as a white film, and, they, and not on the Sabbath. They could collect two portions on the Friday. That was bread from heaven that came through Moses, from God. Jesus is giving us a new bread as the new Moses for a new journey. Jesus said, those who ate this bread from Moses, they died. But the bread that I will give is for the life of the world. I repeat these words. 
He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Six times in John chapter 6, Jesus connects the eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood with eternal life, resurrection, and glorified body. That's the gift of the Eucharist. I've diverted here. Anyway, let's come back. All right. So that's what Jesus did between the third, the second cup and the third cup. He transformed the matzot bread to his sacred body. He took the third cup, the cup of blessing, and made and transformed it into his precious blood. What happened next? Okay, by the way, how do we know it was the third cup that Jesus took and transformed the wine in the third cup? Because St. Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen talks about the celebration of the Eucharist among the Corinthian Christians and warning them, what are you doing? You can't, in chapter 10, he talks about the Corinthians going to pagan temples and eating meals of particularly meats that are sacrificed to false gods. You can't go into pagan temples and eat the meat sacrificed to false gods and then come into our community at our agape meal and have the body and blood of Christ. You can't do both. It's one or the other. And he's warning them in chapter 11 even more starkly. People who are not receiving the body and blood of Christ, they're receiving it unworthily. That's why some of you are sick and some of you have died. And Jesus and, and St. Paul makes it clear that the, it, the cup that we receive is the cup of blessing, the Baraka cup. So Jesus transformed the wine in the third cup to his precious blood. Now, what should have happened? What should have happened ordinarily in the Passover meal after they drank the third cup? They should have sung the Hallel Psalms and then drunk the fourth cup and then the meal would be finished. Is that what happened here? No. Probably what happens now after the third cup when they've drunk the precious blood of Christ is that Jesus utters his priestly prayer that we read in chapter 17. If I said earlier he did it earlier, I'm mistaken. Probably he did it now after the third cup, because when you read John's gospel, it, it's, it, the feeling you get is that Jesus pronounces this priestly prayer and then leaves with the disciples. And when we read Mark 14, sorry, no, when we read Matthew 26, 30 and Mark 14, 26, Jesus then leaves the upper room with his disciples and, this, and I'll read it here. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they drank the third cup. Jesus' priestly prayer is pronounced. Then they start leaving singing a psalm. Probably they've begun the Hallel Psalms and they're singing Psalm 115 first of all. What's missing? What haven't they done? They haven't drunk the fourth cup. They haven't finished the traditional Passover meal in the way the Jews normally celebrated it. Now, Jesus goes into the garden. I want to give you some advice. When things eventually settle down in the Middle East, at least for a period of time, if you ever get the opportunity to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, do it. I've been four times. Three, once on my honeymoon, at the end of my honeymoon, the last week of my three-week honeymoon, and three times for work. I take teachers. I take people who work in schools to the Holy Land. Is it dangerous? Yeah, it can be. But I live in Bankstown, and I feel more in danger in Bankstown than even on the West Bank. Okay? West Bank or Bankstown? Which bank is safer? Probably the West Bank. Okay? Now... When, it's, when there's no trouble, and I, okay, it's not a laughing matter. We know how tragic it is. We both belong to communities from the Middle East that have suffered enormously because of the whole Middle East and Arab-Israeli international conflicts, etc. Okay. Now, well, why did I say that? Because 
Jesus has gone. He's left that upper room and he's got crossed the Cedron Valley, which means muddy valley, but it's dry at this time of the year. So he's going east, down into a valley, then up the valley to the Mount of Olives. And at the bottom, at bottom edge of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of the Olive Press. That today you go there and there's still very ancient olive trees, trees there today. Some about 800 years old. And one of the best spiritual experiences I ever had was actually walking in silence with teachers through those olive trees at night. And then going to the, the church nearby, the Church of the Flagellation, nearby and praying there in silence. There's a rock that's believed to be the rock that Jesus was kneeling on as he was suffering the agony in the garden. There, Jesus says the following words. Take this chalice of affliction away from me. Mark 14, 26. Jesus is praying to the Father. And he's already consented to the will of the Father. He consented to the will of the Father when he gave Judas the, the bread dipped in the horoscope. But he's doing it again now because he's feeling his humanity. He's got a true, beautiful humanity, unaffected by original sin. And the, hum the human nature has this instinct of self-preservation. We don't want to die. Jesus is feeling this, but he's submitting to the will of the Father. And in the garden, he becomes the new Adam. Adam sins in the original garden, disobeying the will of God. Jesus, the new Adam in the new garden, submits to the will of God. Not to be a man seeking to be like God in knowledge, but God becoming man to be humiliated. The kenosis. He lowered himself to become a slave for us. Take this chalice of affliction away from me. Take the cup away from me. Jesus hasn't drunk the fourth cup yet. He's speaking about his passion, death, as a cup that he has to drink. Then, of course, Jesus is arrested in the garden and he's put on trial. There are actually five trials that night. Before Annas, the official authentic high priest, was deposed by the Romans. Then his son-in-law Caiaphas, who was then high priest, and then to Pilate, and then to Herod, and then back to Pilate. There are five trials Jesus endures during that night. And of course, he's ultimately mocked, condemned unjustly through um, envy and cowardice. He's scourged, he's crowned with thorns, he carries his cross, and he's eventually on Mount Calvary on the cross. All this is connected. The Passover of the Messiah is still happening. It began in that upper room when they started the traditional Passover meal with the first cup, etc., etc. It's still happening now. We look at all this as one event. It's just Jesus is adding different elements between now the third cup and the fourth cup, which he hasn't drunk yet. He's on the cross. Just as Jesus is being about to be nailed to the cross, we read in Matthew 26, 13, 31, that he's offered wine with gall. It was an anesthetic. It was meant to numb him so that he doesn't feel the pain of crucifixion as much. Now, Jesus prophesied he'd be crucified. John 3, 14, and John 12, 32, he prophesied that he'll be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. That's John 12. Jesus was to suffer a Roman punishment, not a Jewish punishment, for the Jewish punishment for blasphemy, for you being a man, claim to be God, is stoning to death. But the charge they bring against Jesus before Pilate is political insurrection. You are king of the Jews. There is only one king, Caesar. So he will suffer a 
pay, uh, je, uh, sorry, a Jewish man uh, being punished by the Romans will get crucifixion. A Roman citizen to be put to death is beheaded. That's why St. Paul is beheaded. And St. Peter is crucified upside down because Paul was a Roman citizen. Peter was not. All right. So Jesus, he does not drink that anesthetic because it's a type of wine then and there because it's not the time to drink the fourth cup. He's on the cross. He's on the cross for three hours from midday to 3 p.m. on the Friday. And at this time, John tells us they're sacrificing the lambs in the temple for the Passover meal that the rest of Judea and the pilgrims who've come to Jerusalem will be having that night, including the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the scribes. Then Jesus says on the cross, I thirst. That's a very deep spiritual term, words. It means many things spiritually. He thirsts for the salvation of the world. He thirsts to do the will of the Father. But he also is thirsting and he's asking to drink the final cup. He's asking to drink the fourth cup of the Passover meal. And they, they put the sponge of vinegar, that's bad wine, on the, on the spear. They give it to him. He drinks it. And what does he say? When he drinks it, it is finished. What, what are the words of the Passover meal that the Father presiding over that meal says when they drink the fourth cup? It is finished. Jesus has now effected, completed the new Passover meal. Now, what Jesus has done has transformed a Passover meal that was a memorial reenacting a past event and he's made it into a new meal that affects a new event, a new exodus. So the original Passover meal is to make present by way of memorial a past exodus. Now Jesus has transformed it, this Passover meal, into a new Passover that affects a new exodus. What is... This new exodus. Moses led the Israelites out of the slavery of Egypt. The new Moses is Jesus who's going to lead the new people of God, an international people of God, out of the slavery of sin. Moses led the Israelites through the waters of the Reed Sea. Jesus will lead the new, the new people of God through the waters of baptism. The waters of the Reed Sea destroy the Egyptian army. The waters of bap baptism destroy sin and infuse the life of God and his grace within our souls. The Israelites are in Sinai for 40 years. It should have been three weeks only, by the way. It ends up being 40 years. Post Reed Sea. It's tough. It's difficult. They're in the desert. That's a generation. That's a lifetime how difficult life is even when you're faithful. And the God feeds them water from the rock. St. Paul tells us 1 Corinthians 10, that rock followed them. The quails at night to give them meat and the manna every morning, six mornings a week, the bread. In our post-baptismal life, 40 years represents a generation, but in our post-baptismal life, it's also difficult. And God feeds us during our Sinai. Sacrament of Reconciliation Confession and the Eucharist, the new manna from heaven on a daily basis. And Joshua leads the Israelites over the Jordan River into the promised land. And the new Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, leads us into the heavenly promised land. This is the new Passover of the Messiah giving us a new manna, the Eucharist, for this new exodus to a new promised land, heaven. Now, let me tell you something more about this Eucharist, this new manna. St. Luke uses a word in Greek that's found in no other document written in ancient Greek anywhere. 
epiusion. Epi that's what he uses. It's in Luke 11 to describe the Eucharist. Although it's in the sin, sorry, it's in the prayer of the Our Father. When you look at the Our Father in Luke 11, give us this day our daily bread, it's actually give us this day our epiusion bread. And that's a word in Greek found nowhere else anywhere in ancient Greek documents. It's called a neologism, a new word. Neologism, neologism, a new word. It means above substance. Give us this day our above substance bread. Now, when we pray to our Father, we pray for our daily bread. So we pray for our food, our water, our health, our clothing, our homes, or also our daily bread. Uh, don't pray for McDonald's because, you know, you don't want God to bless them. You know, McDonald's isn't worthy of God or whatever. But anyway, you pray for your daily bread. But also the church fathers like St. Cyprian, before him Tertullian, uh, St. Cyril of Jus Jerusalem, spoke about our daily bread as including the Eucharist. And in fact, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the mid-fourth century speaks about, he translates epiusion into super, super substantialum. So there, when I'm in the Holy Land, and you go to the place called the Paternoster, where Jesus gave us, where it is believed Jesus gave us the, our Father for the first time, you see very beautiful mosaic plaques on the wall by the dozens, 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 and all these different languages of the world. And when you go to the one in Latin, the Our Father in Latin, it has there, not quotidianum in Latin, which is daily, it has super substantialum. Give us this day our super substance bread. So when we pray for our daily bread, we're praying also for the Eucharist as our daily bread. <clears throat> now, remember the term anamnesis. It's a memorial that makes present now an event that happened in the past. That's exactly what the Mass does. When you go to Mass, it's a memorial meal, but it's an anamnesis memorial. It makes a past event present. What does the Mass make present? What Christ did on Mount Calvary. It's not a new Mount Calvary. It's not a new Calvary. It's not a new sacrifice. It's like, in a sense, by analogy, a time machine. The Mass makes that event, that sacred event, that was the Passover, called to the Passover of the Messiah, that brought about the exodus for the new people of God, makes that present for us today. If you had a $2 to put in a, a time machine and you're given just one turn with that time machine, you could go back in time to one place and one place only, where would you go? I'd go to Mount Calvary, AD 30, 7th of April. I want to stand in front of the crucifixion. You do at Mass. That's the, the Mass is an anamnesis. It's a memorial that makes present a past event substantially present but it's interesting here what's interesting here is that it does more than that it makes present christ as he is now in heaven you go to hebrews 12 22 to 23 and the author of hebrews probably st paul many people they're not sure who wrote hebrews describes heaven where god is the angels the spirits of the souls made perfect. And then speaks about Christ and his sprinkled blood. What Christ is doing now in heaven, he's enthroned as king of heaven at the right hand of the Father. He is king of kings, lord of lords, king of heaven, fulfilling what Daniel said in chapter 7, lifted up from the earth and seated at the right hand of the, of the ancient of days. We say in the creed at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He's interceding on our behalf. But he's also priest who ministers in the temple. You go to Hebrews 8, Hebrews 12. Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And he's ministering in the heavenly temple. So Jesus as priest in the heavenly temple is ministering what? What sacrifice is he offering to God the Father right now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty as the one eternal high priest of the heavenly temple of the order of Melchizedek? He's offering the same sacrifice he did on Mount Calvary. 
He's not offering an additional sacrifice or another Mount Calvary. He has this sprinkled blood. Jesus rose in the, from the dead in his glorified body and he retained in his glorified body the five wounds in his hands, in his feet and in his side. So Jesus in heaven is not just Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's also priest offering sacrifice, ministering in the temple. He's offering to the Father on behalf of humanity as we speak right now, the same sacrifice he did on Mount Calvary. And that's the Christ that's made present in the Mass. So the Christ and his sacrifice on Mount Calvary is the same now. That was in time, once and for all in time. It's into heaven now, and it's at the right hand of the Father for all eternity. And that is what is made present in the Mass. So Mass has to be reverent. When I arrived today, I saw that sign you've got in the foyer, how you should be dressing, how you should be behaving. I've never seen one as good as that anywhere in the world. I've been to many churches in Europe, the Middle East, North America, Central America, South Australia, South America, Australia, New Zealand. Never seen a, a sign like that. I took a picture of it and sent it to my friends. And I said, at least they know, that, at least they get it, I said. At least the, the Catholics in St. Thomas Chaldean Church at Bosley Park, they get it. You've got to be reverent because you are have entered heaven. The Mass is making heaven present. You are brought into, not only in front of Mount Calvary, heaven is touching earth through the mass. And you are present before the Christ, the glorified Christ, who is the right hand of the Father now ministering in the heavenly temple. And that's the Christ we receive. And this whole Passover actually doesn't finish with Christ's death on the cross. He drinks it, it is finished, he's dead. And he's buried. Rises again on the third day. Spends 40 days with his followers, his disciples. And then we go to Acts 1. And where, where is Jesus? On Mount Olivet. Go to the Holy Land one day. It's our land. It's the land of Christ. It's the land of the faithful. You'll never forget it. Oh, I could go every year. I'll never get bored. I want to stand. You can stand where Jesus, you could be where Jesus was born where Jesus was crucified, where Jesus rose from the dead, where Jesus ascended into heaven. And on Mount Olivet, recorded there, on Acts 1, there's Our Lady, the apostles, and the 120 all up, and they see, they see Jesus ascend into heaven on a cloud. That cloud is the glory cloud. The Hebrews in the, in the first temple, the Israelites in the first temple, had the glory presence among them. It was called the Anani Hakavod. In Hebrew, Anani HaKavod, the glory cloud presence which departed from them when your ancestors, the Babylonians, came and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And God left because God felt like a wife who's been betrayed by an adulterous husband. Because there is the Hebrew, sorry, the Judeans had, and, and the Israelites before them had gone to worship all other gods. And the glory cloud departed but returned. Pentecost, tons of fire, and the glory cloud before that lifted Christ into heaven. That ascension is part of the Passover of Christ, the new Passover. The Passover of Christ is the Passover meal, his passion, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven, where he is now. That is the Passover. That's the Passover Christ achieved for himself and merited for us. We also are meant to be going through the same Exodus Passover journey. And we are fed, started with baptism, supported by the sacraments of penance and the sacrament of the Eucharist. And we hope one day to pass over the threshold from this life to the next and at the end of the world rise in a glorified body, a body ready for heaven that will end suffer no more pain, sickness, suffering, decrepitude or death, no more tears, and we're in the heavenly glory with Christ for eternity. And that will be the finality of our Passover. On that note, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I have a question which 
Um, so you know how you're talking about how the Lord's speaking to the Eucharist, and you're saying that um, that in the Eucharist we receive the glorified body. On on Holy Thursday, were, would the disciples have received the glorified body? They received. Uh, yeah, that is. That is an excellent question. That is an excellent question. I repeat it. Did Christ on Holy Thursday receive the glorified body of Christ? They received the body of Christ as it was then, all right? which was not yet glorified. They received Christ, what we call the preternatural body. They received a perfect body, the same body Adam had before he sinned. Adam and Eve were conceived and born without sin, with all the supernatural and preternatural gifts. Supernatural gifts, grace, which has prepared them for heaven, right? They were sanctified, elevated, spiritual children of God. And preternatural gifts is a Greek word meaning beyond. They were given gifts that, that uh, perfected them for their life on earth. So they were free from, they had integrity, infused knowledge, impassibility, freedom from pain, immortality, freedom from death, and infused knowledge and all these other wonderful gifts. So Christ had a, a, a body immaculate, without sin, and completely gifted with the supernatural and preternatural gifts. That's the body the disciples received at the Last Supper. Okay? Great question. Very advanced question. All right? Well done. Okay. Yes, next. Sorry. Any other Acting like a teacher when I said that. All right. I was a teacher for too long. Not for too long. I love Who's a teacher here? Any teachers here? Yeah, good on you. Excellent. All right. We need more good teachers. There's one who came up to me before the talk tonight, and she's at uh, Fairfield. And we went on pilgrimage last year to World Youth Day. She went via the Holy Land. I forget her name. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Yes, over here. We don't have to ask questions, but that's all right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so how do you respond to someone like, for example, like the Protestant denomination to who completely reject the, the idea that, um, sorry, the belief that the Eucharist is the physical body and blood of Christ? And just say that it's just me symbolism and, and that's like a matter of faith and like it's, it's just basically you become the body you become part of the body of Christ and it does, it's not really through bread. Okay. I have been through that whole experience myself. I'll tell you a bit of my background story. 1979, I'm 15, I went to the Billy Graham crusade at Randwick Race Course. Billy Graham was a, the most famous Protestant preacher in history. He spoke to hundreds of millions of different people. Um, and this was his third and final visit to Australia in 1979. I went down, did the altar call, gave my life to Jesus Christ. Uh, in a, and so I'll be a better Christian from then on. I associated with the Baptists and the Evangelical Anglicans in senior school and in law school. And uh, I heard all that. I didn't know what to believe. I couldn't, I wasn't sure about whether the Catholic Church was right or wrong. Certainly the Baptists are sim purely symbolic, so are the Evangelical Anglicans. It's only a memorial meal, and it's only bread, it's only wine, it's only symbolic. How did I come to where I am today? I, thanks be to God, I'm a daily communicant since the 4th of um, March, 1987. Okay? And I hope to die that way. So how do I go from one extreme to the other? Because I read things I'd never heard from my Protestant friends the church fathers. From February 1986, I began to read books that talked about the writings of the second century Christians. St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, Tertullian, then in the third century, Oregon, and right through to the fourth and fifth centuries, you know, got the St. Ambroses, the St. Augustines, the St. John Chrysostom's, the St. whatever, whatever. They were absolutely unanimous. My friend said the Baptists were the restoration of the first three centuries of Christianity, but I never read Baptist doctrine, pure symbolism, in anyone until Berengarius in the 11th century and Zwingli in the 16th century. The early Christians were unanimous. 
And Protestants who discover this, they, they panic. This is one famous Protestant in America now named Francis Chan, evangelical. He's just caused a whole crisis within evangelical Protestantism because he now believes in the Eucharist as the Catholic Church teaches. He's not yet Catholic. Let's pray he becomes that because we're, how can the early church get it all wrong? It wasn't just Roman Catholics. It's Catholics everywhere in Egypt, in Palestine, in Syria, in Asia Minor, in Greece, in North Africa, in Rome. All these early Christians, wherever they were, east and west, north and south, all believed that it was the body and blood of Christ. They can't be wrong. St. Ignatius of Antioch was ordained by St. Peter. He was a friend of St. John. He died as a martyr in the Roman Colosseum. He didn't get it wrong. He didn't invent it. St. Justin the Martyr said, as I have been taught, he wrote that in 156 AD to the Roman emperors, as I have been taught, the body and blood is not, the bread and wine is not common bread or common drink, but it is the body and blood of that saviour who died for our sins. I'm paraphrasing here, chapter 66, first apology. Okay? Now, with Protestantism, by the way, another reason why I can't believe it, not only because it's, uh, uh, it's novel, it's nowhere found in the first millennium of Christianity, but because the Protestants don't agree among themselves. They don't have one position from the very beginning. Luther and Lutherans today believe that Christ is present in the bread and is present in the wine. The bread remains bread, the wine remains wine. But Christ is present, body, blood, soul and divinity. They call it not transubstantiation, but consubstantiation. Two substances together. And but Christ is present through the faith of the people. Now Calvin taught that Jesus is present in the bread and in the wine, but spiritually only through the faith of the people. It's Zwingli, who is contemporaneous with Luther, operating in Switzerland rather than Germany or France, he believes, he introduces pure symbolism. It's only bread, it's only wine. Christ is not present at all. So Protestantism is, cannot be inspired by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't inspire contradiction. Right? And these, are, these men introduce novelties and contradictory novelties. I can't believe that. I will not believe that. That's why I believe the Catholic Church must be true Look at the Eastern Orthodox that are not in full communion with Rome. They have the Eucharist. Why? Because it's, it's, they got it from the apostles. They have the same teaching, the same beliefs as we do on the Eucharist. Thanks be to God. They didn't make it up. They received it from the apostles. They have apostolic succession like we do. It's Protestantism. It's the newfangled invention of the 16th century onward. They can't even agree among themselves. If the Catholic Church is wrong on the Eucharist, Christianity is false. The first millennium, there was no true Christianity. They were all idolaters. Christ was lied. He did not keep his promise. He did not protect the church from error. Okay? I hope that's clear. All right. All right. Next here, yes. And there's one at the back. I won't go beyond nine o'clock, okay? Uh, I have a question. The on like carvings and stuff, like carvings, yeah, yeah. Because like, yeah. I had someone who was Catholic telling mm. me that that she's um, thinking of going against the Catholic Church because of that. She went, Oh, if you read in the Bible, it says not to make graven images and all that, and not to make what is what, 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 what is um, what is below, what is in heaven. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, and it's not say that, 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 but she misunderstands it because what they do is that the Protestants separate that commandment into a second commandment when it's part of the first commandment. So it's not a commandment. When you take it as a separate second commandment and look at it by itself, then it gives the impression it's, you're meant to have no statues, no images, nothing carved, nothing three-dimensional, nothing two-dimensional, nothing in heaven above or the earth below. But they're divorcing the purpose of the commandment from the first commandment. Basically, the first commandment says, I am the Lord God who took you out of the house of Egypt. You are to have no other gods besides me. And next sentence, and yet if you're going to have no other gods besides me, you are to have no other statues or images or pictures of other gods besides me. It's logical. You have only me as God, 
and you abandon all the pagan gods and all the statues and images of the pagan gods. Now, those statues and images were either representative of gods that didn't exist or were believed to be gods in themselves. And both of those are errors. But there was never a prohibition against statues and images per se because we know from the same Bible that God commanded the Israelites to make statues and images. They filled the temple. There were statues of angels in the temple. They're in heaven above. Are angels in heaven above? Yes. But they, uh, the prohibition against images of anything in heaven above was of the sun and the moon and the stars because the pagans worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars as gods. So, but the, the, in, the arch, in, in the temple, they had statues, statues of angels. They had statues of angels on the Ark of the Covenant, cherubim the most sacred relic of ancient Israel. When the Hebrews were in the desert of Sinai whinging about the manna, this is Exodus 21, or Numbers 21, sorry, God sent snakes among them and bit them and they were poisoned and they were dying. And they appealed to Moses to intercede with Yahweh, please save us. So what does Yahweh command Moses to do? Set up a pole in the desert, make a statue of a snake out of bronze, put it on the pole, and everyone who comes up before venerates that snake on the pole will not die of the snake bite. That's a statue. Three-dimensional. Carved. Well, that's an image against the second commandment, which is really part of the first commandment. Is God contradicting himself? No, we've got to look at the purpose. There's nothing wrong with having statues and pictures, three-dimensional and two-dimensional, of the saints of God, of Christ, because Christ is real, he exists, he's not a false God. And we don't believe that the statue or the picture itself is a God. But you can have sacred images. And you can, you can bless these images, and graces can come to us through these images, but the, the, they come from the living God. And to have statues and images of saints is not violating the commandment because we don't regard these saints as gods. We know they're humans. We know they're just creatures. But they're, they're humans who followed Christ. They're examples for us to imitate. Like St. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And, and Jesus said that the woman who washed his feet with her hair and the perfume will be remembered. So we're meant to remember the saints there's not, you, I go into your church, I see statues everywhere. But are you worshiping them as gods? Do you put up your hand if you believe that the Virgin Mary or any of the saints are gods? Put up your hand if you believe that any of the statues and images of the Virgin Mary and the saints or the prophets or any Old Testament figures are gods. None of us do. This is nonsense. Protestantism, like many other beliefs of the Catholic Church, misrepresents and distorts creates straw men, then attacks the straw men and claims they won the fight, they won the argument. Sadly, the, the whole Protestant world is a collection of misrepresentations, distortions, and even lies when it comes to the Catholic faith. Right? So if God can command images right, that can be used properly, then we can have images that can be used properly. As long as we don't regard the saints as gods or goddesses, and we don't regard the statues themselves as gods. They just bring to mind Christ and the saints. There's nothing wrong with that. And then heaven above is the stars, the planets, and the, and the sun that were worshipped as gods. If it meant that what was in heaven, angels, and why is God commanding angels on the Ark of the Covenant and in the temple? All right. One more question at the back I saw. I think that's all. That's uh, it. So a round of applause for... Uh,